Eros, the Greek god of love, son of Aphrodite, his counterpart in the Roman gods is Cupid. Um, Eros is love, mostly of the sexual passion as we talk, so he's um, not romance per se. If you wanted romance, you would go directly to the goddesses and not the gods. The gods handle more of the desire. Um, so, we have a few things that are written inside some of the Greek epics that tell you a little bit about the history of him. And that is, uh, Hera addresses Athena. We must have a word with Aphrodite. Let us go together and ask her to persuade her boy, Eros. If that is that if that is possible, to loose Nero on Aedes' daughter, Medea, of the of many spells, and make her fall in love with Jason. There's another one where he's mentioned. He, Eros, smites the maid's breasts with unknown heat and bids the very gods leave heaven and dwell on earth in borrowed forms. And another one there where he's mentioned is uh, once when Venus's son Eros was kissing her, his quiver dangling down a jutting arrow, unbeknown had grazed her breast. She pushed the boy away. In fact, the wound was deeper than it seemed, though unperceived at first. But she became enraptured by the beauty of a man, Adonis. Eros drove Dionysus mad for a girl, Aura, with the delicious wound of his arrow. Then curving his wings flew lightly to Olympus, and the god roamed over the hill scourged with a greater fire. Which is awesome, right? Eros's greatest love story is truly that one of Psyche. The story of Eros and Psyche has a long-standing tradition as a folk tale of the ancient Greco-Roman world. Long before it was committed to literature, in the Latin novel, The Golden Ass. The novel itself is written in a picaresque Roman style. And yet, Psyche remains her Greek name. Ero becomes, Eros becomes Cupid. Eros and Aphrodite are called by their Latin names in the story that is most well known, that's Cupid and Venus. Cupid is depicted as a young adult rather than a child. The story of Eros and Psyche tells of a struggle for love and trust. Aphrodite was jealous of the beauty of the mortal princess Psyche, as men were leaving her altars barren to worship a mere human woman instead. And so she commanded her son Eros, the god of love, to cause Psyche to fall in love with the ugliest creature on earth. But instead, Eros fell in love with Psyche himself and spirits her away to his home. Their fragile peace is ruined by a visit from Psyche's jealous sisters, who caused Psyche to betray the trust of her husband. Wounded, Eros leaves his wife, and Psyche wanders the earth, looking for her lost love. Eventually, she approaches Aphrodite and asks for help. Aphrodite imposes a series of dis difficult tasks on Psyche, which she is able to achieve by means of supernatural assistance. After successfully completing these tasks, Aphrodite relents, not happily, she relents, and Psyche becomes immortal to live alongside her husband Eros. Together, they have a daughter called Voluptus, or Hedon. <laughs> Hedonism, right? Voluptuous, right? Meaning physical pleasure, bliss. Kind of seeing where a lot of the words are coming from, right? Eros, eroticism, their child is voluptuous, sometimes called Hedon for hedonism. So you've got quite a bit of our words that we use now in love spells and in, in the essence of love and what we consider to be love, now seen where they're coming from. In Greek uh, mythology, Psyche was the deification of the human soul. She was portrayed in ancient mosaics as a goddess with butterfly wings because Psyche was also the Greek word for butterfly. The Greek word Psyche literally means butterfly, which translates over to uh, a deeper meaning of esotericism, of soul, spirit, breath, life, or an animating force. The term erotic is derived from eros, 
as has been used in philosophy and psychology in a much wider sense, almost as equivalent to life energy as psyche is. In the classical world, erotic love was generally referred to as a kind of madness, or what was called theomania, madness of the gods, because love could take over so greatly and so um, immensely, and that love at first sight was considered madness, and, and the wanton desire and the longing uh, could, was considered driving somebody mad. See that where that phrase comes from? Driving someone mad. And that comes from the entire idea of eros, the, exotic, the, the erotic love, being theomania. At times, the source of the eros was said to be the image of the beautiful love object itself. In other words, seeing the love object. If these eros were to arrive at the lover's eyes, they would then travel to and pierce or wound his or her heart and overwhelm him or her with desire and longing, which is also called love sickness. Now, love at first sight is considered ordained by the gods. In other words, if you're not building a relationship but you see someone and the both of you are, boom, love at first sight connected. It is said that the gods are the ones that arranged that meeting, or that somebody had asked the gods to arrange that meeting. And Eros had come down and pierced some of the beloved with an arrow. Now, there is the other sense of it, and that was, um, it was uh, said that uh, Eros could um, cause people to uh, incite hatred at the same time, even though he's a love god. If, uh, if he was, you were shot with a lead arrow instead of his golden arrow, it would incite hatred between the two people. So Eros is used in two very separate and distinct um, types of magic in that sense. So when you ask for Eros, make sure you ask for the golden arrow or the lead arrow, but be specific. How does this apply to us in uh, the Tree of Life? Because everything is on the tree, and we know that. The Tree of Life is the idea of bringing Tipperus into Malkuth to you. In other words, bringing beauty and love in that house into Malkuth where you stand. It's the idea of completion of Tipperus. Remember, all the houses um, eventually arise back in Malkuth because Malkuth is the enclosure. And so all the houses form three different triangles and are placed inside the circle. Um, so in this case, you are um, getting the uh, perfection of love and longing and desire into your house and perfecting it here. Cupid, on the other hand, although he was a La uh, Roman Latin offshoot of Eros, has his story too. Um, Cupido, in Latin, is desire. He's the god of desire, erotic love, attraction, and affection. He's often portrayed as the son of the love god Venus, and in Latin he is known as amor, which is love. Now, in Latin literature, Cupid is usually treated as the son of Venus, and that's how we usually see him, but without reference to a father. There are some uh, ancient literature out there that says that Seneca, for example, says that Vulcan, um, as the husband of Venus, is the father of Cupid. Cicero, however, says that there are actually three Cupids. He gives us the Trinity, as well as three Venuses. The first Cupid was the son of Mercury, and Venus is Diana. And the second of Mer it was of Mercury and the second Venus. And the third is of Mars and the third Venus. Um, all the, the uh, Cupids do the same thing, but if you look at it, there's the first Cupid, uh, and you can call on all three Cupids, but the first Cupid with Mercury and Diana would not only give you love and lust and, and, um, and passion, uh, but it would also open up the communications between you and your loved one. The second 
uh, with Mercury and Venus, would um, get them to dream of you and to see the beauty uh, in, in, intensely and to have that long, that long love sickness for you. And the third of Mars and Venus brings in the passion because it's kind of like love is war. So it's the war and the love kind of put together of the Mars and the Venus. But Mars is more than just war. He's also that sexual passion, that excitement. And so you get the heavy excitement with the love on the third uh, Cupid. When you call in a Cupid, you usually get all three Cupids anyway. This last Cupid was the equivalent of um, Amperos, which is counter love, one of Erotes' gods who embodies aspects of love. Um, and that is because it's opposites. And so if you're having opposition in your household or you're fighting a lot and you want that to quit or there's a mutual hatred going on between the two people and you want that to go away, you call the third Cupid. And Shakespeare mentions the Cupid in A Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, in The Midsummer Night's Dream, and then he says, love looks not with the eyes but with the mind. And therefore is winged Cupid painted blind, nor hath love's mind of any judgment taste. Wings and no eyes figure unheedy to haste. And therefore is love to said to be a child, because in choice he is so oft beguiled. Then um, German man said that uh, Gold Hold Ephraim Lessing said, though this sting was the more made wiser, the untiring deceiver concocted another battle plan. He looked beneath the carnations and roses, and when a maiden came to pick them, he flew out as a bee and stung her. Uh, how does that apply to the Cupid story? Cupid was once said to have gone to get honey in the trees to mine his arrows, and um, he got stung by the bees, and he cried out to his mother Venus, and he said, why must such a small creature deliver so much pain in a sting? And Venus looked at Cupid and said, my child, for you are small, and you deliver a painful sting also. And so it is considered a being stung by Cupid, Zeros. Now, Cupid's story with Psyche, and again, this is kind of relevant to the whole Eros to, to Psyche. The fame of Psyche's beauty threatens to eclipse that of Venus himself, herself, kind of like what we saw with Aphrodite. And the love goddess sends Cupid to work her revenge, just like Aphrodite. Uh, Cupid, however, becomes enamored of Psyche and arranges for her to be taken to his palace. He visits her by night, warning her to try not to look upon him. Psyche's envious sisters convince her that her lover must be a hideous monster when she finally introduces a lamp into their chamber to see him. Startled by his beauty, she drops hot oil from the lamp and wakes him. He abandons her. She wanders the earth looking for him and finally submits to the service of Venus, who tortures her. The goddess then sends Psyche on a series of quests. Each time she despairs and each time she is given divine aid. On her final task, she, is retrieved, she has to retrieve uh, a dose of uh, Prosipines, Prosipina's um, beauty from the underworld. She succeeds, but on the way back cannot resist opening the box in the hope of benefiting from it herself, whereupon she falls into a torpid sleep. Well, this is kind of going in the whole sleeping beauty area, if, you, if, you, if you're listening. Cupid finds her in this state and revives her by returning the sleep to the box. Jupiter grants her immortality so the couple can wed as equals. So the, the whole idea of the Valentine's Day and love and all that was to overcome any obstacles and quests that you might have that would bring you um, closer to your love so that you could live happily ever after. It's also to make sure that you get love at first sight. Omnia vincit amor. Et nos sidemos amore. Love conquers all. And so let us surrender ourselves to love. Kama Diva, also called Kama, 
is the Hindu god of human love or desire. The name Kamadeva, highest uh, Kamadeva, can be translated as god of love. Deva means heavenly or divine. When you see that in any of the Indian names, uh, Kama means desire or longing, especially in the sensual or sexual love. Now, Kamadeva is represented as a young, handsome, winged man with green skin who wields a bow and arrows. His bow of ma is made of sugar cane with a string of honeybees, and his arrows are decorated with five kinds of fra fragrant flowers. Five flowers, actually, are Oshaka tree flowers, white and blue lotus flowers, Malika plant, which is jasmine, and mango tree flowers. You see how almost every um, philosophy, there's the bow and arrow, everyone's got the honey and the bees, the flowers, okay, the arrows to shoot and the love, um, and, and it's almost standardized and by, by just different names. And so, and since different cultures had different scents available to them, it would bring out different scents to the person. Now, the Kama Sutra is an ancient Hindu, Indian Hindu text, widely considered to be the standard work on human sexual behavior in Sanskrit literature, written by um, Bhatsyayana. A portion of the work consists of practical advice on sexual intercourse. It is largely in prose, with in inserted uh, on the stop, poetry verses. Kama, which is one of the four gods of Hindu life, means desire, including sexual desire, the latter being the subject of the textbook. Sutra literally means a thread or line that holds things together. Okay? When metaphorically refers to um, aphorism or, or line rule formula, okay? like a formula. However, if, you, if we stop right this second, we think Sutra would be like the string theory that we use inside magic, particularly in the chaos theorem or in any quantum magic theorem. It is the idea behind like uh, produces like. It is the formulas that hold together alchemy. And it is the string that holds together the paths of the tree of life. So again, back to alchemy, back to the trees. Like, Keep repeating it, but it's it's interesting to know that almost every philosophy really has the same trunk and then just different branches of the tree uh, on on the philosophy, but it's all the same tree. Contrary to popular perception, especially in the Western world, Kama Sutra is not just an exclusive sex manual. It presents itself as a guide to a virtuous and gracious gracious living that discusses the nature of love, family life and other aspects pertaining to pleasure, orientated faculties of human life. And Kama Deva is the main god who it was brought after or that people call for in the Kama Sutra. So Kama Deva then goes into the intense guidelines of the sexual desires inside love traditions. Um, now, I'm going to give out a couple of rituals. There's a ritual to Eros. Close your eyes, and after closing your eyes for a moment, center yourself. You can do that by breathing deep, seven seconds in, seven seconds out, seven times. You give an offering of barley, and you say to the givers of life, here's life. And you sprinkle the barley on your altar. Or if you, just, if you don't have an altar, just sprinkle it on the ground in front of you. You wash your hands and face in the rose water and you say, With this rose water I am cleansed. I enter the presence of the gods, purified and free from pollution. I am ready to be filled with love. Walk around the altar circle and sprinkle rose water onto the ground and say, With this rose water, this is now sacred ground. If you have people in the circle with you, if you're leading it, okay, Go and sprinkle a little of the rose water on their hands. And you call Aphrodite. Hail Aphrodite, primal daughter of the sea. Hearken to our call, golden goddess, and attend our rites. Lady of love, lady of all people, we praise you. It is Aphrodite who causes love to blossom and passion to burn. We come here together to honor her for all the loves she has sent our way. 
But let us not forget that she is not restricted to romantic love. Our Cyprus born lady is greater than that. Aphrodite causes the husband to turn to the wife, but also the mother to embrace the child, neighbor to feel friendly towards neighbor, the bonds of brotherhood to strengthen, and peace to blossom in the, in the hearts of all, greatest Aphrodite, sweet smelling persuasion. We come before you in awe, daughter of sky and sea. We come before you in reverence. We come before you in adoration. We come and offer to you, great God, a sweet wine and rich chocolate. And thanks for all your gifts. You light a pink Aphrodite candle at that point that's just Aphrodite. Pour a libation of wine and offer the chocolate to the goddess. Then you call Eros, her son. For she strengthens all the goodness in your life. Eros shall shoot the arrow. Hail, Eros, primal son of the golden goddess. Hearken to our call, great Eros, and attend our rites. Primal firstborn god, though you carry the arrows of love, you are no, more ch you are no mere cherub. Golden-winged one, this mystery is this. You who cause the love of Mother Earth and Father Sky. Yet, you are a child born of the goddess of love, great Eros. You are a passionate mystery that is, that is never unraveled. We come before you in awe, mighty Eros. We come before you in reverence. We come before you in adoration. We offer to you sweet wine and rich chocolate. And thanks for all your gifts. Light a red candle to Eros that's dressed to Eros. Pour a libation of wine again and offer the chocolate to the god. At this point, you should light two sticks of a combination incense of Eros and Psyche that have been properly named with herbs and atars, or um, an incense that's properly made with herbs and atars, uh, and oils that are to Eros and Psyche. And then you partake of the chocolate and wine. Think of what you want, who you want to come to you. Think of what you want to come to you. Call out the name or names of your desire and what you want from them. Ask Eros to shoot his arrows into the heart of the one you want to become the apple of your eye. Ask Aphrodite for the beauty and grace to maintain it. Take a moment of silence to meditate on the mystery that you just asked for. Thank Aphrodite and Eros and end the ritual. And when in Eros psyche, oil on the throat and wrist, when around the one that you want for general attraction. So you can do this, uh, generally attract somebody into love, or when you're around the one that you desire, wear it so that they are constantly drawn to you. There's a simpler ritual, the one to Cupid. Um, I kind of made some simple ones for you. Okay. Write, write your full name plus your beloved's name okay. in red ink. Draw a big heart over it. If you know how to do the Bodhu, um, Urzele, or Urzele's heart, then you can combine that in. Otherwise, it's just a heart. And by the pink candle that has been dressed for Psyche, okay. and a red candle that has been dressed for Cupid. Light two, two incense sticks of the combination of Cupid and Psyche so that the smoke is a combo of both of them. Um, and they've been properly made, or any of the uh, incenses that have been properly made. Wave the heart through the smoke of the incense. Place a few drops of uh, Cupid Psyche oil on the heart and on your wrists and throats. Throat, and then you chant two times. I call on Cupid to make, say the name, fall in love with me. Please shoot a love arrow. Cause the both of us were meant to be. So mote it be. Two times you do that. Then you thank Cupid and you keep the heart under the mattress. Have your beloved dream of you. Wear the oil when you are around them or for general attraction. There's other ones that you can do such as taking an apple, okay, carving the names into the apple, covering the apple in honey, and burying it so that you ground the love to you. The other one you can do, and, and, and make sure that you know you, you, you um, wrap the apple um, with um, uh, some kind of ribbon and pour a few drops of the oil on it and then bury it. Um, 
There is the other one that you can do, and that is uh, take two pictures, one of you and one of you, your beloved, and um, uh, place them so that they're facing forward okay, with honey in between. Wrap them with a red or pink ribbon, or both if you choose. Place a few drops of um, whatever god or goddess you're going to work with, whether it's uh, Kama Diva, Diva or uh, Cupid and Psyche or Eros and Psyche. And then you place that into a plastic bag, like a Ziploc bag, and you place that under your mattress. And when you go to go to sleep at night, you focus on them, seeing you in their dreams. And of course, you've got the honey and the oil on there, so what they're seeing is being with you, longing for you, desiring you, needing you, and almost obsessive about needing to see you again. The planets and the alchemy of love magic. It's very simple. Love is Venus. It's pink. Sex is Mars. It's passion. Lust belongs to Saturn. And it's not black Saturn, it's the purple Saturn for debauchery and, and lust. An attraction, just to bring someone to you, is green. So if you wanted to work purely in the alchemical sense, then you would, you would set up a pink candle, a red candle, purple candle, and a green candle. And you'd place those in like the sections of four, and you would then uh, place the beloved's name or picture in the center. Right, you can do either Venus and Mars, Saturn and um, a magnetic attraction oil. Or you can choose to do the gods that were mentioned. Or you can um, just choose one of the planets. Or you can uh, bring in just... Um, uh, any of the gods or goddesses that you like to work with, um, including Kamadeva, if he's the one you like. Um, this is a um, great alchemical sense. In the Babylon sense, uh, you would work with the planets. Um, but you would work with um, Lilith and Jezebel and um, we, the, the whore of Babylon which is a different aspect of Lilith. And so you would work with those three goddesses to bring men to their knees and to bring about a great success in your relationship that is prosperous in all aspects. And so you would run those god goddesses. Now, how do they work together? Well, Venus is pink and it brings in love. And so that's just pure love. It can be like the love of a puppy, the love of a best friend, the love of a family member. It's just love in its purest form. So if you just do pink on its own, you're not asking for anything other than somebody to go, oh, I love you. Um, you add in sex with Mars. That's red. He, his color is red. And he brings in passion, sex. But if you just use a red candle on its own, then you're a booty call. It's just sex. Intense, but just sex. No love, no feelings behind it. And if, you, if you add in lust to it, that would be Saturn's purple. Then you're asking for uh, love, sex, and lust. Well, then you're asking for someone to long for you, someone to lust after you. But if you just do it on its own, then it's just lusting after you with no deeper meaning or no deeper properties to it. And green is attraction. It's not money. It's, it's attraction. Yellow is money. And there's so many alchemists out there who claim to be alchemists get this so wrong because they're not trained properly. And green is the color of a magnet. Therefore, green magnetically attracts to you. So, if you put green into the mix and you have pink for love, you're attracting love. If you have green with red, you're attracting sex. If you have green with lust, the purple, you're attracting lust. If you put them all together, you have an attraction of love, sex, and lust. So, and um, good alchemists can actually put one candle together for you if you want, 
and be able to dress it in, uh, accordingly to the plants. And the reason why they can work together is they're not diametrically opposed. In other words, fire and water are not represented here. So say we wanted something with the moon in there, um, it couldn't go in with the sex because sex is Mars and that's fire and we can't have oppositions in it. So we stick to this and we rely on the pink aspect of Venus to um, pull forth um, no fighting and, and um, peace and passion and peace in the, in the relationship as well as romance. We rely on Mars to bring in the sex. Now, the alchemy of, of the works that are presented here is simply the fact that um, the herbs and the oils, they, they create a representation of vibration to the body. It's the idea that aromatherapy took on and then went sideways, completely sideways about and lost themselves. And the idea is, is that the oils and the herbs that you use and the candles that you use, they create a vibration on your body. And they create a vibration in the mind of those that smell them. If you're looking at the right colors of the candles, that creates the right vibration um, in the head, in the mind uh, of the ideas that you're heading forth. In other words, that's like a focus tool. The smoke of the incense rises up, not only gives you the vibration and gives the vibration around you, and it sends it up into the universe, into any gods or goddesses that you call down, to understand exactly what you're asking for, because the scents then travel as, as well as the oils do. So this is really, um, when you look at anything, again, whatever philosophy you want to use, you are technically really just providing names to alchemy. And that's okay. The vibrations of certain names and the energy that was given to the certain philosophies, gods and goddesses, remain intact by decades and millenniums of, of um, worship. And so you are tapping into that energy also, uh, but you're using alchemy to do so. So again, um, even if you don't partake in this particular philosophy to say, say um, Indian is not your, the, the Indian Hinduism is not your, your thing. Okay, but Kama Sutra and, and Kama Diva look interesting and you'd like to have that called down to you. Keep in mind, everything's the same trunk and it's just branches on the same tree. Alchemy is the one that allows you to skip around branches. So, you know, people go, well, what if it's not in my philosophy? Well, if it's not in your philosophy, through the years, all philosophies, and, and I'm an anthropologist of ancient religions, and through the years, and I've studied, and I've seen that the religions all started kind of at the same place, and they're all heading at the same place. And they kind of weave around and through each other, begging, borrowing, and stealing from each other. And all you got was different names on different philosophies. And although there's a slight bit of difference in how it's orchestrated and launched in the philosophy, um, it, it's what um, reigns true to you. Um, and, it, and of course, if you can skip the dogma part of the philosophy, you're much better off because then you can, you know, have a freedom to roam throughout philosophies without uh, ascribing to the dogma that may bother you. And so in um, love spells, um, as in any spells, you want to make sure that you are um, going to ask for the right thing. You're going to ask for something that's possible. The best thing that you can do, um, and this is, this is from the Egyptian times, is that you wrote in some sort of ancient language, of course they used hieroglyphs, um, exactly what you wanted, and whether it was a person and you wrote their name in hieroglyphs, or if you don't have a person in mind, they wrote down the aspects of what they wanted. 
In other words, I want somebody who's funny. I want somebody to pay attention to me. I want somebody who will work. I want somebody who's not married. I want somebody, you know, with no baggage. I want somebody who's not a drug addict. I want somebody who's not an alcoholic. You, you see, and you have to be very specific about it. I like somebody who travels, or I don't want somebody who travels. And you get very specific in this, and, and you write down everything that you need. And when you write down everything that you need, um, you find that the, the universe, instead of throwing something to you and saying, oh, geez, here's the nearest thing to you. You just asked for someone. And that's what you get. And, and so many times working as a practitioner, I've heard people say, um, I, I, it worked, but it, it brought me a whole bunch of people I don't like and, and I don't want. Um, and they brought me creeds or weirdos. And I said, well, did you focus on exactly what you wanted? They're like, no, I just asked for, bring me someone. Well, the universe brought you someone. You have to be more specific. The universe doesn't have time to reach your mind. And that's why you call on the vibrations, whether it's the Baudu or the Le, Loa, or the uh, Oshun Santeria, or the Greek Eros and Psyche, or the Roman Cupid and Psyche, or the Indian uh, Kamadeva, or her, um, what's another one that's out there? Um, asking Aphrodite herself, or asking Venus herself. Um, it, it's, it's, it's all, it's, it's the vibrations that you're calling in are the specifics that you're asking for. And so, you know, it's, to um, in, it give you insight to what you want to call the deities down. It is to call on the vibrations that are sitting there in a big pot of energy that everybody has contributed to. But it's also to focus your mind on exactly what you want so that whatever universal energy you believe in or that you're calling forth or that you subscribe to um, brings you exactly what you're asking for so that you don't waste any more time in life and, and you don't want to waste time right now in, in, in life because you know bad relationships may teach lessons but you know if not lessons that, that we fondly want to continue doing all the time so um, um, this webinar was brought to you by Babylon Gardens Apothecary you can find them at BabylonGardenApothecary.com. Oils and incenses can be found at BGA on the website in the specials tab. And we do ship in 48 hours of receiving an order. And BGA will actually be hosting this webinar on their site soon. The candles that were mentioned can be found at Pampite's Magical Marketplace. She also does traditional incense, not stick, but she does traditional incense. She's found at Pampites.com. And she's in the heart of Hollywood, California. I... And my classes can be found at my website, Jimmy Darling, at jimmydarling.com. And my alchemical blends in this webinar will be found at BGA, where they have got me as the master alchemist at Babylon Gardens. So, with that, I say thank you for attending this webinar. And I hope to see you all at the next one. And uh, see your, your faces, well, your names, at least, on the next webinar. Um, tonight is uh, Ceremonial Magic. 